So we're calling the meeting to order. Yes. 1.04 p.m. on this December 17th, 2014. So is this, you said this is actually not a work session. This is a formal technical advisory committee meeting. Well, the request by the policy committee was to have us get together in a meeting to to have this kind of discussion. So I, I can go over the notes and or the minutes and give you the exact resolution from the policy committee. Please do so. So, so, uh, yeah. uh, so at the, let me just back up just a little bit to start with what the PAC did. So with their meeting when they had the discussion on the socioeconomic assumptions, there was there was uh, one presentation by our consultant, and uh, the TAC had a little different viewpoint on it. And so when these, this topic came before the policy committee, we had a staff recommendation and a, a TAC recommendation. And so when it got to the policy committee, the policy committee had extensive discussion on it and then moved at the end to postpone action on uh, the approval of this uh, topic, allowing staff and the consultants to engage with the Matt Subur and Kabata and attempt to refine numbers. So they asked us to get together in this kind of meeting to kind of get a sense of what the, what the numbers were and how they came about from both sides, both from the the AMATs through the RSG consultants and through the Matt Subaru who used the HDR in preparation of uh, their model. And so that's kind of the idea for today. That's what we're looking for, just a presentation by both sides of what they are and as it said, to attempt to refine numbers. But we don't really have a decision point today. The next TAC is when we have the opportunity to do that. So is there a way that we could say, rather than running this as a meeting, just have it as a work session? Because we're not going to have any sort of formal re presentation, us having to ask questions, open mm -hmm. it to the public back. Well, we will have a presentation by HDR. Uh, that's what the PowerPoint is for. Okay. Uh, I'm, uh, the RSG will have a presentation as well, although it's not a PowerPoint. So. Well, if I may kind of add on to what Craig has said, Mr. Chair. Um, in working um, and recognizing, too, that I had missed the work session um, for the technical committee on the socioeconomic assumptions, <coughs> and yet working through the, the, the issues at both the technical and then attending the policy committee meeting, um, I realized that there's, um, that the intention of the technical advisory committee through the development of its policy uh, and procedure having to do with <coughs> regional cooperation and coordination on the um, uh, socioeconomic assumptions with our neighbors to the north, uh, that, that it may not have occurred to the level that the TAC, or, or that I, I can say that myself had, had uh, thought or expected it to occur, also recognizing that I was probably the only member on either the TAC or the policy committee that really had a familiarity with uh, the planning work and the assumptions used and how they developed their model in the Matsu borough. And it has to do with the fact that the model that they are using for their LRTP update um, was originally uh, updated through the Wasilla Bypass or the Parks Highway Alternative Corridor Project. And as a result, in my other life, I. It, it, in my professional work, I was working through that process and understanding how that developed. Um, and so that I, it is something that I really wanted the, the technical committee to understand and to see because it's different. It, we have different assumptions. We have different time frames. And there's been a, a, lot, of, a lot of really good work that, it, that has occurred in the Matsu Borough and how the Matsu Borough develops has a direct, we, we, are, we have an interrelationship here because of our connection on the Glen Highway and also with the proposed connection uh, with Kinnick Arm. And so I really wanted to, uh, my intent in, in asking staff, when I recognized that, that there had been, um, this information sharing hadn't gone forth at the level that, that, uh, that maybe we would all would benefit from, I asked staff, you know, my staff to coordinate with, with Craig and with Matsu Burrow and their consultants to, um, it, it, to come and present information. How did they do it in the Matsu Borough? How does the Matsu Borough envision its growth occurring over time? Um, and also as a technical committee member, the, the action that was the, the technical committee um, had taken was that Anchorage used, you know, if Anchorage, uh, the municipality felt that the 
that you know if it if the DOL numbers are really good for Anchorage let's use that for Anchorage and yet what the technical committee did not agree to was to have um, AMATs go in and do any kind of planning overlay um, with the Matsu borough that they would use the Matsu borough's assumptions and that's where the resistance came and that's why the policy committee was faced with two different sets of recommendations um, and so, you know, I, I view this as a, and since then we have had a presentation by the Kinnickarum Crossing Project and their consultants, and um, they have also presented that information to the Matsu Borough. And so I, I really saw this as an opportunity to, to learn, not to debate the validity. I mean, all of these, every, all anybody who's worked with these, yes, anybody who's <laughs> worked with these, uh, 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 crystal balls know it's only as good. <coughs> as that moment in time. And so how do we work together on assumptions? And where, where I, I was reluctant as a technical committee, and I think the, um, it was to, to make any assumptions, have Anchorage make any assumptions about planning in a Matsu borough. And yet I had a reason for that, that, no, that I really wanted to allow people to understand um, what's going on. And so it, my intent was to, for it to be an, a very informal work session, but if we need to record, if it's advertised as a meeting, you have to take minutes, that's fine. It's just uh, um, to allow it to be much more um, informal where people can engage and ask questions. That was really my intent. And so... Um, I think we can still have that intent, but it is good to have documentation because if the question comes up again, <laughs> we have it in writing. So I, I see on here one of the first things we want to do. Should we go around the room and do introductions? Was that intended for? Sounds like a good idea. A lot of people in the room. A lot of <coughs> yeah. So that way, do you want to start? I'm Craig Line. I'm the AMATS coordinator. I'm Sharon Walsh. I'm the court anchor representative on the technical advisory committee. Jim Steele, somebody. Uh, Patrick Flynn, Policy Committee. Uh, Jerry Weaver, Community Development Director, TAC member. Jerry Hansen, Project Management Engineer, TAC member. Ken Morton, DOT, TAC member. Uh, Jennifer Witt, DOT, TAC member. Stephanie Marmillo, I'm the Municipal Traffic Engineer and also the Chair of the Technical Advisory Committee. And I'm Steve Morris, I'm the Health and Human Services Representative on the TAC. I'm Lauren Driscoll, I'm the Chief of Planning for the Mason Borough. I'm Brad Swartz, I'm the Pre-Design and Engineering Manager for the Mason Borough. I'm Judy Doherty, I'm the DOT Director for the Mason Crossing. I'm Jeff Fricanja, I'm the RSG Consultant Team Project Manager for the AMATS Travel Level Update. I'm Peter McClung, and I caught up with McDowder and I'm the RSG. Oh, I'm Lee with RNM Consultants, we're on the project team with Jeff um, and McDowder for the Travel Demand Model. Gary Katzian, and Kittleson and Associates. Murph O'Brien, uh, HDR and the project manager for the MSB LRTP update in 2014 and into 2015. Laura Cummins, HDR, also the Matthew Burrow LRTP team. Uh, Tom Brigham, HDR, I'm the project manager for the bypass project where the model was originally developed and on the team working on the MATS LRTP. Kevin Hemingway, I'm the uh, finance officer for DOT for the Kinnikon Crossing Project. John Springer, working with the consulting team of the uh, AMATS Travel Demand Model. I'm Vivian Underwood, I'm Transportation Planning for the Municipality and Stage AMATS. I'm Eddie Hunting, I'm State Commodifer with the Alaska Department of Labor and Development. Uh, Jim Calvin, also with the Bell Group. Teresa Barron, the Senior Transportation Group. James Boyle, I'm the DOT. So just a request, um, for those of us that are sitting at the table, we have easy name tags in front of us, so it's really easy to know who's making the comments, but anybody in the audience, I want this to be an open discussion, but if you could just remind our own taker here of your name before you start saying anything, that way we have a clear um, <coughs> set of notes of who said what in the meeting. That's the only request that we can kind of keep track of this. <laughs> um, you want to go ahead? And so uh, first would be Jeff. Right, Jeff Kanja, with uh, the status of the AMATS travel demand model. Thanks, Craig. I'll stand up so I can project my voice a little more. Um, so I, uh, as Craig already mentioned, uh, I've been asked to give you a status report. The um, history has already been remarked on here, which is that the travel model update started last summer and is, or was currently scheduled to be completed by June 2015. The um, 
milestone that brings us into this discussion was the approval by the policy committee of the socioeconomic projections for use in the AMATS travel model and the AMATS planning process for its next MTPO date. So uh, as you know, the reason we're having this discussion is that uh, there needs to be some you know, understanding, mutual understanding of uh, the estimates and comfort on your behalf. And so we um, are on hold now. So, so the main status report is that from the project perspective, almost all tasks are on hold except for those that are absolutely critical no matter what we decide to do with the socioeconomic projections. So that means also that the uh, schedule will necessarily elongate because the milestone date and the critical path proceeding from the adoption of those projections has already passed. And so we, of course, be prepared to work with your staff to rescope the schedule as necessary, uh, depending on the conclusions that this group reaches, there may be budgetary implications as well as schedule implications as, and trade-offs amongst some of the previously scoped tasks to invest more analytic time in socioeconomic projections. Um, you folks have previously been given both written reports and presentation materials that specify both the method and the results of the socioeconomic estimates for both base and future years that our team prepared. Though, except for a minor tweak to one base year number um, that was arrived at because of some of the TAS level allocation work that was started before we went on to hold, um, that all remains the same. So I had not intended to repeat that, but we have those materials available uh, in presentation form if folks have questions. We also have some handouts that summarize, um, for, for the agenda item coming later, we prepared some handouts that summarize our estimates relative to the current MASU model estimates relative to Prada and relative to the ICER 2009 products. So from the point of view of the consultant team and what I'm engaged to do for your staff and your agency AMADS, um, the question really comes down to what socioeconomic projections should AMADS use for its model update and its plan update post communication. And um, you know, so we will be uh, happy to help answer questions um, later in the agenda, but that's my status report as of right now. Thank you. Uh, quick question. Uh, as far as the model development being held up, is it is it true that you can you can develop, develop a base year model, correct? And those those um, assumptions aren't in question, are they? Well, it's an excellent question and I suggested to staff because there are differences in the base year estimates as well as the future year estimates that not, you know, not full, not having reached consensus on everything, it seemed to me unwise to proceed with the base year model until everyone had reached comfort with all the estimates. So if, if, if we were able to provide you with uh, assumptions for, for the base year, you could proceed, if, if, even if the projections were in question, we say we're still working on that uh, number of weeks from now, you could, if we could at least get you the base year assumptions and agree on those, then we could proceed. Is that my understanding? Well, in a, in a strict yes or no sense, the answer would be yes. In a more nuanced sense, as I said earlier, if there are additional uh, resource requirements to working on the projections that would involve our consultant team, then since we have a fixed budget, there may be tasks that would have to be traded off to conduct the work necessary to complete the future year projections. So uh, since that trade-off, since there are a lot of different improvements that were scoped and requested by your agency, and they have costs that go with them, there's a risk in us proceeding with the base year model, because the base year model includes some of those improvements, one of which perhaps, or, or you know, there may have to be compromises to get the future year projections done. So uh, in my discussion with staff, it seemed um, wiser to see if we could reach closure first before proceeding with anything, because we might spend money that we actually wanted to have on some feature that is really important. Does that answer your question? I think so, yes. Any questions for him? Okay. Um, Mr. Hayes, Ask a, maybe this is better for later. I'll wait till later. <laughs> I'll write it down. <laughs> well, I guess 
This is, and when I came to the TAC, like I said, I came in the tail end of the, the finalization of the previous MPP, and now we're in the process of updating the model and bringing and working towards our next MPP. And I guess I, <coughs> being a traffic engineer, I have done some macro scale modeling. Most of mine is kind of micro of when I'm looking at things. Um, and looking at AMATS and how we're doing our modeling, I guess, and how it connects to the borough. Um, I, I guess I, I kind of want to get a better understanding of how, how we're addressing that and how we are doing this connection because we are two separate entities. I know that we are very, eventually are supposed to be working towards having a regional transportation group, but I kind of see us as, you know, yes, we have AMATS, yes, we have the Matsu Borough, and right now we are only connected by one one thing, <laughs> the Klein Highway, you know, kind of. <laughs> We have a point at which once you get past the point, you're considered the Matsu Bureau. The other way, you're us. Um, and I guess in the model, are we are we really only? I, I guess I'm not understanding previously and now whether or not we're actually trying to go further into the Matsu Bureau with the AMATS model. Or are we pretty much just saying once you hit this point, you're considered within AMATS, and then we're letting all of the origin destination assumptions and everything else that we know. I mean, take control of where those people once they come in to AMATS, where they're going? Um, sure, it's a good question. I'll give my answer and the AMATS staff may want to elaborate, but from an analytic viewpoint, if you look at the observed data, you know, the household survey data, the travel patterns and things like that, for example, roughly 30% of work trips originating in the Madison Valley area are destined for Anchorage. So it's clear analytically that Travel patterns in the entire region, including Madison Valley, Anchorage, Bull, and Judea, and the River, are all interconnected in many ways. Mm -hmm. And so, <clears throat> even strictly from the point of view of Anchorage planning purposes, our recommendation as modelers would be to internalize all of the major origins and destinations in the actual model structure. Because then you get both uh, you know, explicit model treatment of trip distribution, meaning where people are coming from and going to. Uh, and you get a response to different possible socioeconomic developments in the future so that the model is capable of responding to a different array of inputs because in you know four more years after the next full plan adoption, AMS will have to update the plan again. And the socioeconomic inputs will change, of course, because of that, that four years of experience on the ground. And so you get a, even, even looking at it strictly from, you know, if you say we're, we're really planning only for areas within the Anchorage Bull, it's still, in our opinion, a better model if it internalizes all of the main travel in the whole region. And so your, the, the, the model is enlarging its geographic scope to include the Matsu Valley. Just as Matsu Borough's current model includes the Anchorage uh, area because of the same travel pattern. Sorry, Mr. Flynn. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. <laughs> um, I know you guys did a pretty extensive survey uh, <coughs> of the citizenry, the traveling public. What was your sample size within the municipality of Anchorage, and what was your sample size in that super row, roughly? Oh, well, that's a good question. Um, do you have the. Overall, I can answer this question. Yeah, um, I'm I, with I've, looked at the totals, but no, I've looked at the <laughs> yeah. totals, but not the individual sub-area breakouts. Sure. So the sample size was roughly 60,000 people, and the split was 70% Anchorage, Amats area, and then 30% Mats area. Um, yeah, between 55 and 60,000 was the entire sample population, but split 70% Anchorage. And Okay. Yeah. Right. Responses. The responses yeah. also show the 70-30 splits. We, we had a very high response rate. Um, over 2% of the entire region responded, which 2% to 6%, excuse me, which is considered a very high percentage for this type of housing travel survey. So it's comprehensive. And the report should be out soon, is what I 
to your branch visa. Okay, you have that report. <laughs> so when you say two percent to six percent, you mean two percent to six percent of that sixty thousand people right. mm -hmm. responded. Okay, and it was I remember seeing the information. It was seven thirty seventy thirty split between right. Anchorage and Madison. Right, the ACS in Okay. Yeah, so three thousand total responded. That's the yeah, yeah, and six five point nine percent response rate. So almost. Any other questions for Jeff before we have the net super routine present? Huh? <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Come on. Well, I'm actually going to introduce Tom and Lori from HDR. They're going to talk a little bit about the model. They're really kind of um, the technical side behind that. Um, but I, I, I hope this kind of brings along some discussion that we can have about some of the things that Matt Sue's been doing. Um, We've been talking with some planners and some regional uh, components, but I don't think there's any kind of been some formal discussion about how these two models are going to mix. And I think the timing's excellent, though, with your travel demand model going, and we're in the middle of our LRTP, so there probably couldn't be a better time to be having this discussion. And I think from the presentation Tom's going to share with you, you're going to really be able to get a sense of where those numbers have come from. Some of the major projects we've been having, like the bypass, has really brought about some of those numbers, and then also focusing on our connection with Kabata. We also have a full-on build-out analysis that the borough's been managing and maintaining for over five years now that looks at our expected growth numbers. And I know as we've been doing LRTP, we've been taking in some of those numbers into the model. So we've got some pretty comprehensive numbers right now. With that, Tom? Thank you. You have a PowerPoint for us, correct? I do. Okay. <coughs> of course, all dependent on being ready to work. <laughs> okay, so um, what I'm going to do or would ask to do is really just talk about uh, the work we did for the Matsu Borough and the state of Alaska. Uh, initially on the, uh, the Wasilla Bypass Project, which you may be aware of, it's a the idea of a uh, highway bypass south of Wasilla to basically take through Parks Highway traffic uh, off the Parks Highway and route it. You know, it would start around Seward Meridian Highway, it would head to the south, it would then join back up with the Parks Highway in the vicinity of uh, Big Lake Road. And um, our analysis showed that uh, it would be expensive, but it would do the job. It would reduce traffic on the Parks Highway in Wasilla and probably preclude the need for six lane the highway through town, which would be uh, a problem in a number of ways, as I'm sure you can appreciate. Anyway, um, so I'll just sit down and proceed. What I'll talk about is uh, the background of how we developed the Matt Sue part of the traffic model. It's been a unified model, as I think most everyone's aware, for some time uh, since the days of the Highway to Highway project. And um, what has typically happened in the past is that Anchorage AMATS would update the Anchorage part of the model, uh, Matt Sue would update the Matt Sue part of the model, and <coughs> Speaking for Matsu, at least, we would simply <coughs> take whatever the latest and greatest in Anchorage was and, and use that uh, that as the Anchorage part of the unified model. And um, so, I'll talk a little bit about how we developed uh, the Matsu side of the model, and kind of in so in the background here is we've simply used whatever the, the latest on the AMAT side was as to, to populate that part of the model. So our objectives, and, and this is a bit of a mix of the bypass project and the Matsu LRTP because it's essentially the same models being used for both. We did a more intensive development process with the bypass, uh, the model for the bypass because we knew it would be used then subsequently for the LRTP. 
Uh, if we're only doing work for the bypass, we probably wouldn't have invested as much time and effort into it because really what you're testing is, um, you know, what would the bypass accomplish? Would it pull enough traffic off the parks highway to make it worth doing? Uh, it, it was a very much a focus on that corridor and not on the entire MSP. But when we began the, the LRTP work, what we discovered, you know, we tested and we're quite happy that from uh, the point of view of did it replicate traffic well throughout the Matsu borough, the answer was yes, it certainly, uh, it certainly did a good job for that. We were able then to just move ahead and apply this uh, to the Matsu LRTP work. So, um, these are objectives primarily for the, uh, the bypass project, the Parks Highway Alternative Corridor. Uh, that project, as of Monday, is essentially complete. We had our last steering committee meeting. Um, we <coughs> updated the uh, Matsuburo Transcad model. It's based on uh, primarily on the 2010 census numbers. Uh, 2035 target year. Um, as those of you who followed growth in the Matsu know, the growth in Kinnick Fairview along uh, Kinnick Goose Bay Road has been really significant. Um, and it, it is sort of driving the transportation train to some extent uh, and the need for. Um, uh, the need for road expansion in the in the valley. So what you see is that a significant part of the population growth in the last decade plus um, in Matsuburo has been in the Western Valley, while most of the jobs are still in the Eastern Valley and, of course, in Anchorage. So the key elements of uh, the work we did were really what, what are the rates of household employment growth? And at the time, the best source of that was the regional ICER model that I think a lot of folks are familiar with if you've, if you've worked in this in the area. Uh, and then, especially for the borough, um, we didn't do any prediction for Anchorage, but so where will the new households and jobs be located? There is um, a very light touch in the borough, as I think you're aware in terms of planning and zoning. And so uh, the free market pretty much determines where uh, new houses go. We assumed a set of additional roads that would be in place in 2035, the base case set, and I'll show you those in a moment. And um, we simply used the latest AMATS piece of the model uh, for the anchor site. So I'll go through, I'll try to go through these relatively quickly, but to just kind of give you an idea of the depth that, that we went to to develop the data. Um, in terms of 2010 households, we basically used 2010 census data and then the Matsu Borough tax records to, to focus in a little bit. We uh, used GIS to join the tax data and the MS, the Matsu Borough's parcel data set which gave us a, a much better picture of the actual number of residential units that are were in each TAZ. Um, so we took the, the households um, household size from the 2010 census and produced a population estimate of 79,280 in 2010, which compared really well to the Department of Labor's estimate. Uh, 2010 employment. This was a lot more difficult because uh, as those of you who worked with this data, I think, probably know, uh, the census does a you know a great job, and you have lots of data for population. You really don't have anything for employment. It tells you is this person employed. It tells you where the employed people live. It doesn't really tell you where the jobs are or where they go to work. <coughs> so we used. Uh, Department of Labor unemployment insurance records, which the Department of Transportation was able to get, they're confidential. We weren't able to, to share them, of course. We used them confidentially. Um, and the American Community Survey data. Uh, and I'll show you the kind of the total. We had 
41,300 employed residents, but only 25,700 work in the borough. So this is kind of a challenge with any plan, but it's especially a challenge in the Matsu borough because you have so many people working in so many different places. You know, we obviously, you know, there's a lot of people who come to Anchorage, but what kind of amazed me is there's something on the order of 5,000 people who work in other places, the North Slope borough. Uh, there were even fishermen working in Southeast. I mean, it, it was, um, it, it's really interesting. At any rate, uh, and so we use the Department of Labor data to locate current employment, and we then interviewed the larger employers to kind of make sure that we were accurately recording where those people actually went to work. Because in the data, if it was a large employer that had many employment sites, they were all shown in one place. The, the, usually the headquarters where uh, you know, who provided the records to the Department of Labor. And so basically we were able to, to I think, get a lot more accurate um, information about where the people were actually reporting to work, which of course is what you want to do when you're, you're doing your travel model. And so we um, cross-referenced that with the Matsu Borough ownership and address records uh, to make it, again, make it a little bit more accurate and then we had to estimate um, data for small employers who do not report uh, unemployment. <coughs> you know, they're, they're not part of the system. And uh, the self-employed. So this is what that looked like. You start out with people living and working in the Matsu borough, and uh, add other categories that were not included in that work, and we came out with a total of about 25,000 people, uh, jobs or self-employment in the Matsu borough, of which about 95% were in the modeled area. Uh, and so in terms of 2035 forecast for households, um, we basically took the, uh, the 2010 census again and inflated it at the ICER base case rate of growth. 3.19% per year, which gives us about 65,000 households in 2035. Uh, locations were based on workshop results. We did some uh, workshops with folks invited who knew a lot about development in the Matt City, real estate folks, school demographers, everyone we could, we could find and convince to come uh, who we're aware of how the borough developed and how um, it's likely to develop in the future because again, you know, there's, there's not a <coughs> deterministic uh, plan there. So those workshops were very helpful. We also had a second meeting with uh, commercial developers and that was interesting. Um, we did a lot of GIS, GIS analysis with the data in the Matsu to remove land that was already developed, remove land that you couldn't build on due to environmental constraints, like it had a lake, for example, or it had a big wetland or something like that. And so what was left in each TAZ was the amount of land that actually could be built upon. Uh, and we used that amount at the typical uh, uh, density of development in the borough, which is about acre to half acre uh, per household to determine how many households were likely to be built in each of these TAZs and which TAZs were likely to grow more quickly than others and that was based on the information provided by the, the development community. Uh, and in all of these cases we worked with the Matsu Borough staff and, and asked uh, staff to review what we've done, agree that it was it looked uh, good to them. So here's an example of one of the outcomes of the workshop we did <clears throat> primarily on uh, residential uh, development and it, it, it was really kind of interesting because a lot of the folks who've worked in the borough developing things know where the water is good, where it's not good, you know, because you're sinking wells in most cases here so you have to be able to sink a well and actually get, you know, ideally hit water. 
uh, and, and, and and everything else. And so it was a, a sort of a huge mind meld of uh, sort of local knowledge uh, and everyone <laughs> sort of a a joint view of what the future was going to look like to this this uh, assembled group. And if I may, Tom, and one of the reasons uh, that that was such a critical part of the, the analysis is because there is not zoning for most of the borough. I mean, the cities have some, there is some areas where they're like the port area, et cetera, but that was a critical component um, to the development of the assumptions because um, without zoning, we don't know if it's going to be residential or, or, um, or commercial. Right, okay, yeah. What also helped to validate those numbers was that those assumptions or those recommendations come from those different developers also jive with our build out analysis. So our build out analysis is a GIS model built over many types of data layers to take into consideration the attributes in which you can use to build and develop. So steep slopes are taken out, water, kind of many of the same things Tom was talking about for this model. But then much of our historical data was put into that and those two jived almost identically. So it was a really good verification process. And it also kind of identified, I, I think the time you may have mentioned, but which areas were likely to develop sooner as opposed to later because right. of those attributes. Okay. Right. So for employment, um, we again used the ISO base case mid-range rate of growth um, that got us to 48,000 jobs roughly in 2035. Uh, and Again, future employment locations were based on uh, results of a couple of workshops, additional data. Uh, the commercial developers were really very helpful because, you know, they were predicting which nodes would tend to grow more quickly than others between now and uh, 2035. And we we further. Uh, sort of divided all the employment data into the various uh, stick categories, mining, construction, retail, and everything. And that was, I think, you know, initially we were wondering whether it was going to be worth the time, but in the end I think it really was. Because when you look at a particular kind of employment, it's much easier to really say, well, yeah, we can predict where, say, the uh, healthcare jobs are likely to be in the borough. You know, there's a, a hospital, there's kind of a nexus developing there and so on. So here's uh, here's employment 2035. Uh, you see the effect of the Kinnick Arm Crossing. There's a large sort of commercial development area uh, near the port. And, uh, Is the red one down there? Correct. Yeah. <coughs> as well as growth along the Parks Highway and down in the Goose Bay Road and in the traditional sort of employment centers of Oak Palmer and uh, Wessel. Okay, I'm not going to talk about these. These are the base case projects that uh, Matsuburo, DOT, um, and the cities all agreed were very likely to be built by 2035. So they become part of the roadway network even though they are not there now. Well, I'm sorry, I had to step out of the room for a minute to ask a couple questions about the, the, the jobs data. Yes, certainly. So, you need to back a couple of slides there. Yeah. So, um, what I think I heard you say earlier was that you had some 2010 uh, Department of Labor data to help populate where you expect, where employment was currently. Okay. Yes. Okay. And the ICER numbers for, for the projection were promulgated in, was it 08? We didn't use the earlier ICER numbers. We used the 2010 census number, since it's a, a more recent number. But we used the ICER growth rate from 2010 to get us to 2035. Okay. And how did, my part of the, reason for this discussion is there's some divergence between the ICER growth rate and the Department of Labor growth rate. Do you, what, what is the variance, roughly, or do you recall? About 20% in terms of population in the borough in 2035. Does that translate into job numbers as well, or is that a different path? We didn't really examine that. 
I mean, that, that number came out last summer, as I recall, and we were pretty much finished with the modeling you know, for this project, and also, frankly, for the, the borough LRTP at that point. Okay, but, um, yeah, and, and I haven't really th examined or thought about employment, but just in terms of population, the difference is about 20% lower. So if we back of the envelope, we might presume that that jobs number is 40,000 as opposed to 48,000. If the Maybe. labor statistics and the divergence from nicer urban systems. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've only just seen a couple of numbers and it, it didn't seem like the jobs number parallel the population number. So I, I would be hesitant to really make any prediction at this point without kind of looking at the data. Um, so I'll go through this quickly. This isn't really the, the point of this meeting, but the, the model results, of course, run with 2035 population and employment, the current road network, plus all these base case projects. And what we were testing with a bypass was obviously a, with a bypass and without a bypass. And here's 2009 existing. Everything looks okay, except sort of the middle of Wasilla, and we all know Kent Goose Bay Road is pretty congested, the northern end of it. This is what it would look like in 2035 not good and this is what it looks like with the bypass so we were able to answer the question of well if you add the bypass does that help the parks highway you know and you can see yep it sure does um, there are still a lot of problems that the borough will be addressing in the LRTP which is what to do about with the Department of Transportation which is for example what to do about Connecticut Goose Bay Road and the Palmer Wasilla Highway, the two biggest uh, pieces of red here. And so we then took that and did a break even analysis, uh, which, um, you know, I felt was, was really quite interesting is that if you, if you build the bypass uh, or if you expand the Parks Highway, do either of those really pan out? You know, are they worth it? Uh, is it worth the investment? Do you have a benefit cost ratio that's above one? Uh, and those questions, you know, they're asked of some projects. They're not really asked of all projects. But uh, they, the, the department did want to ask the question in this case, and I think it's, uh, it's uh, an interesting analysis. So that's about it. That's all I have. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. There, there may be uh, some. And, and actually, just uh, to Tom had mentioned that this Wasilla bypass project the, on the planning side is, is finished. And I think um, it's pretty significant what the final agreement is and for for those who are planners uh, um would really appreciate this because of the commitment and the realization at both the borough and the, the city of, of wasilla level that to be able to move forward with this wasilla bypass when in an environment where there is no funding to go out there and secure the corridor that they are willing to really look at their policies and uh, land use um, it, development policies and set asides it, to to work with the dedication of the um, of a corridor through planning and, and planning processes, recognizing that there is going to need to be, you know, funding ultimately to purchase the right of way. But it's it's been uh, widely recognized that if if that corridor isn't preserved soon, then we will forever have the Parks Highway through Wasilla. I mean, that's kind of the realization. Even those people that out in the in the Wasilla area that are most potentially impacted by this corridor get it I mean they recognize even though they might be personally impacted yeah. that there needs to be some level of, of commitment for another facility and so I am um, in it it's because of my familiarity with the in-depth analyses that was done um, through the, this large area I mean the Matsu borough is the size of what West Virginia and the entire Anchorage bowl would fit very neatly in between Palmer and Wasilla it gives you an order of magnitude of how huge that area is 
And so to be able to advance planning, and, and, and Lawrence mentioned their build-out analysis. I mean, they're looking, is it 50 or 100 years ahead? 100. <coughs> so that really doing some, some very good analyses in the borough because they have all of that land. Um, it's to make sure that they secure what is already public land for those purposes that will be for public use, you know, for schools and for fire stations and libraries and those kinds of things. And so, um, it, but this is, if it hadn't been for the Vassal Bypass Project and for their subsequent LRTP, I know that even I at DOT would not have been a, as engaged in or aware of the level of planning that has occurred in the Matsu Borough. And I also understand that um, um, that as the planning staff is working together on a quarterly or whatever basis that they proposed, you know, an, an inner, maybe a, a three-way working agreement. But I mean, those are some things that could be talked about. But I, um, it, it is, uh, it, and also the testing that uh, happened with HDR, because that was my big concern on the other side was, you're not messing with Anchorage, are you? Um, you know, because that would have been of concern. And, and actually they were able to, to calibrate the model such that it really well reflected what Anchorage's model was saying for the MTP for the large facilities, which is really important, m mainly the Glen Highway. Um, and so uh, that is... Um, that all I understand. <laughs> I'm sorry, if I could just add kind of one other thing to this discussion. I think one of the things that we've really learned about the borough in the last five or so years as we've been doing a lot of these models is the growth that we're experiencing, where that growth is going to go, is, isn't going to change drastically. It's really about how quickly those things happen. It's a given. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick my foot in there and talk about the bridge for a minute. There's always, you know, I think since the moment I got to Alaska, there's been a bri with bridge without bridge scenario discussion. And we at the borough, um, since the moment that Kabat has become realistic, we, we consider Whitbridge. And, and that's the way the planning department heads through that. And, you know, whether the bridge doesn't or does or does not happen, that still doesn't mean that KGB isn't going to develop. I mean, it is literally a living version of like a Pac-Man game, just chomping down that road. <laughs> and it either happens in 50 years or it happens in 100 years or it happens in 25. That, that's, that's the question that we ask ourselves, but whether that road needs to be upgraded, whether it needs four lanes, you know, those questions, they still need to be on our LRTP priority list. And, you know, the development of, you know, relieving some of the pressure on the Palm Rosilla Highway still needs to happen. I mean, all these pieces are there. So, you know, one of the reasons that we particularly um, use the ICER numbers in the past when kind of going back and forth between um, Department of Labor or ICER is ICER was a bit more event driven. So when looking at that, and I know that's been acknowledged in some of these documents, you know, for the borough it made sense. We were looking at that event as a, as a time catalyst for what was going to be a priority for us. But if you take that out of the scenario, it still doesn't change the growth pattern within the borough or those actions. So it's just about a timing event. So people are kind of wondering, well, how does that integrate with Anchorage? We're still gonna have people coming back and forth to work. <laughs> so that's not gonna change. And where they're going in the borough. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. President. I, I, I think I agree with all the distribution of uh, households and employment. It seems like you you have got that nailed. It seems to me like what's fundamental though is that ICER growth weight at 3.2 percent for households and 2.8 percent for employment. Those assumptions were made. What is that? 2009. I can remember with ICER. Yeah. It's been a long time. A lot of a lot of things have changed, and it seems like I mean, and, and I'm just making a guess. I don't think that that's probably realistic anymore. I think that the growth rates are. Um, going to be slower given the economic climate, and I think that's what's driving these differences. And I just wanted your opinions on that. Yeah, I guess one of the, I guess, questions to dovetail with what you're asking. I, looking at this, really, yeah, the, the base assumption differences is, is that this time around, I mean, previously we were using the ICER data, um, but in this update of the MTP, we have to go with the most recent calling for the most recent projections available to us those for us now at this time the most recent ones available to us are the Department of Labor and Workforce projections and so there are differences and I guess my question and following up on this and, and it's a question I've had is I thought I, I've heard and these are just always things that are hearsay is that the, that ICER data may not be updated again in the future so the next time I guess you're going through the process of your LRTP and if you're anything like I mean it's not something that you just put on a shelf. You have to go back and update it every four years. So when you go and update your pro your 
your projections in another four years, there's the likelihood that you're probably also going to need to shift to the Department of Labor and Workforce because those are going to be the most recent projections available to you. If, if that were to so to happen, and I think, you know, I talked to a few people about this this week. I think there's a desire to have some coordination between these numbers, but there is Anchorage's numbers and there are our numbers. And we're going specifically with this model. I, I've heard this phrase tossed out a lot in the last few weeks is, you know, most recent numbers, most recent numbers. It's a lot easier to get most recent numbers for Anchorage. You guys are a big city and the numbers are getting taken very differently. We plan for this huge area. Getting the most current numbers is very difficult. We went with these numbers and this model, particularly for this LRTP, because there was so much emphasis put into all those details, it really gave it a much more complete number. So if you were to ask what is the most complete and relevant, it really was that model. We could pull current numbers right now and they still wouldn't be nearly as complete as those numbers are because of that data and that background that was put into really knowing what our employment was like and our population and those types of things and having the decennial census in there. So, you know, I, I definitely think in four years, you know, we're going to have to go and, and see if that model is correct. And, you know, we're going to need to update that. And the other piece is really the whole economic component that really has happened in like literally the last four months. You know, the oil, oil barrel price has changed dramatically and, and we've been at the LRTP for almost a year now. So. I mean, we just talked with our consultants a few days ago and said, mm, we might have to go back and revise our priority list because, you know, honestly, you know, that's one of the reasons why we do this. I mean, our LRTP is looking 20 years from now. I mean, and as Jennifer said, our crystal ball is only so clear. And I feel this way as a traffic engineer. I'm like, you know, I can be plus or minus 100% on certain <laughs> days, you know, um, that you can only see so good. But in that 20 year time frame, you're going to update this five different times. You get another opportunity. I mean, every time we do this, I mean, so really, as, as we're looking at these numbers, I'm, I'm trying to kind of grasp the gravity, I guess, of our differences and see how we can address them. Because I don't think anybody in this room thinks that we need to match exactly. I mean, that's the point. We have different priorities for different areas. We're looking at things. Obviously, we are connected <coughs> and we are areas of influence with each other. I mean, we have those overlapping areas of influence. What I'm trying to get out of this, I guess, and how I'm trying to understand it is, I guess, how is the Matt Subaru treating Anchorage in the sense you said you, you use all of our, um, our our numbers, our AMATS numbers, but I guess how is that coming into your model and like kind of coming in and leaving? Are we just basically shown as like a point and then how it's influencing? Because I mean, yes, I know you have a lot of people coming in, <coughs> coming into to Anchorage, but there's also, I was looking at your numbers as we're going through there, there is a certain amount of people who live within Anchorage, well, a map, I should say, Anchorage, Chugaki, Yuba River that go to the Matsu Borough work. So we do have overlapping areas. I guess, and I, how is the model, I guess, the Matsu Borough model treating Anchorage so that you're using our numbers as we update them? It's basically, a, you know, it's a big consolidated model. I mean, when you run the Transcad model, the whole area runs, you know, it's running Anchorage, it's running Matsu, and what we've done, what we did, was basically take the, the last last best Anchorage data for households and employment and use that. We didn't, you know, we didn't uh, um, worry too much about how current was it. I mean, because you know each plan is being updated roughly every five years, and so sure, yeah, the next time around, I mean, once this work is done you'll have a better estimate. And the same a few years from now in that suit. But yeah, it's just, it's one great big integrated model. Okay. So you actually do, you just kind of take our model. I just, we, uh, we take the, the employment population by TAZ for the Anchorage side, and we don't uh, do anything to it, we just use it. From what year, the 2010? <coughs> I'm sorry. You used 2010 data then? Is that what I heard you said? We just right. used whatever, um, you know, I don't recall. We just used whatever the latest Anchorage work was. For example, if we were to do this, do an update of this model next year, we'd use the result of the work that's going on right now because it would be finished. We'd have new, I, I may have revised the, the TAZ pattern, you know, we'd have new data and be ready to. To do that. And I think there's actually uses the model that Anchorage used for its most recent NTP update. That's 45 years old, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I guess that, that calls into 
question, I, I mean, the, the discomfort I had uh, already uh, voiced was um, any, any uh, um, and it gets back to, I, I don't really understand the need for AMAS to have data beyond the Glen Highway and beyond the Kinnickarm Crossing. Why does Anchorage need to have, um, it, and the proposal that was given to us was just to take the Matsu Borough's numbers and just, uh, the way I recall, is to reduce them based on the, the, the lower growth rates projected by DOL. And, and that I wasn't comfortable with because of the work, I mean, it's the Matsu Borough that knows, I mean, doing a wholesale cut across doesn't make sense because some of those areas are so clearly going to develop sooner than earlier. It's a different data set than what we're getting from the Department of Labor. We need to have a reasonable justification for where it is. We ask the question, and we don't have an answer, what is the job growth differential between what ICER predicted in 20, 2009 and what the Department of Labor and Workforce Development predicted this year? We don't have that answer. If the answer I mean, sure. so, so to say, well, we're going to take 2009 data and a rate of job growth <coughs> that we have demonstrated is inaccurate, then we better have a better answer than, well, we'll just take that number because that's the best we can do. That's not defensible. But actually, if I may speak from the, the technical committee where this was debated, it was for AMATS to do planning for the Matsu Borough saying that we... I'm not the asking AMATS to do planning for the Matsu Borough. I'm asking for a good number. That would be... That's okay. a good question to get that information. So, I appreciate, by the way, that the Matsu Borough is doing a much more um, comprehensive job of planning. What would be useful to AMATS is if your planning department provide us with an updated jobs projection based on Department of Labor and Workforce Development data that we know has reflected some of the non-events <coughs> that have occurred since we last had the ICER date um, in 2009. The other aspect of that is useful, and, and I apologize, I don't know the Matsu planning process as well as I know the Anchorage planning process. My understanding is, correct me if I'm wrong here, Murph, the LRTP is what you guys use to populate the STIP. Or do you have another? It's been many years since I was a planning director. I will have to defer to Warren. <coughs> yes, we do use the LRTP to guide the STIP. I mean, the STIP is... Because you guys have to do your own TIP, right? No. Correct. No. But I can tell you, I can answer it this way, and this is Murph O'Brien, <laughs> former planning director, former DOT guy, and now a semi-retired consultant, is that, you know, from 2007 to 2010 to now, many of the same projects that were identified in 2007 are still the priorities now. And there have been some headway on addressing some of the projects that have been identified to improve Trunk Road, right in my neighborhood, that is now a beautiful highway. Only took 32 years to get there. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know, the, needs, you know, the needs list has not changed significantly from the last LRTP update in 2007. Uh, certainly the Parks Highway Alternative Corridor you know, identified you know, the, the benefit of, of the bypass. And its modeling also said you need to address the Palm Russell Highway. Judy was, I think, involved with that at one point in time. We've got probably $100 million worth of right-of-way to acquire to make something happen. So a lot of the big ticket needs are just moving forward. And the question that's, that's facing us is you know, not the fact that they're congested, because they are, is how are we going to fund the improvements? Well, I guess your question, Mr. Flynn, about those numbers and the difference between those numbers, you have a consulting staff that should be able to get those for you, the difference between those. I mean... And I have a technical advisory committee that doesn't want to listen to my consulting staff. Well, I, mean, it's not oh, I'm, I apologize <laughs> if that's how I came across. Or not, you asked a simple question about the difference between two sets of numbers. I mean, we can get those for you, but then it's up to you guys to decide what, if you want one set of numbers or not. 
Yeah. You know, I, I think one of the things that I, I talked about with Craig on the phone this week is I didn't really want to come and debate whether our numbers were better or worse or which ones are better, best for you guys. I mean, we, we know, and I kind of made clear why we're using this set of numbers, and I fully respect why you guys are going to make the choice you're going to. If there's some desire from DOT or, or from AMATS to have a greater collaboration on traffic modeling, then I think that's probably another conversation to have. But at this point in these two projects, maybe these two projects are a catalyst for the next go around in four to five years that we have this discussion and we're better prepared for it. But at this point, you know, we're you know, over halfway through our LRTP process and going with this model. I'm not asking you to reset your LRTP. You are correct though. The next round, we better be better coordinated because this is kind of embarrassing, frankly. Uh, and, we can't get our act together. Yeah. And, and one of the questions I had, I mean, in looking at this, I mean, we're obviously we're connected, we're areas of influence, and the, the differences in our numbers, <coughs> we do have some differences in our base, but they're they're definitely more similar. Where we're really starting to differ, differ is in the long term projections, really. And as I'm looking at this and asking myself, is this something that should keep me up at night <laughs> when I'm looking at this in the areas of them, you know? And, and, and as you said, the, the projects that have been identified as the needs in the short term, I don't think that the differences in the numbers and, the, and, and our models of what's being shown in the Mass Suburban on Anchorage are going to have any impact in what we're saying that our project priorities are within our Metropolitan Transportation Plan or within your LRTP. I really don't think that our differences are going to change those because those those corridors that are having problems now, you know, they're going to continue to have problems with acknowledge that it's it's the funding to me. I was as I was sitting there thinking, my my thinking times at the gym, and as I was at the gym thinking about this, um, was you know really looking at when we go through this MTP, it's going to be looking at those financial assumptions and where we're going to have our short term, our long term, and our illustrative list, which is probably going to get much bigger as I'm thinking about this and the last time that we were dealing with these financial assumptions. So I, I guess that's still I'm trying to think, do I feel when I'm looking at where our numbers are and like factor of, you know, of looking where we are in a bell curve and how, how far we are, are off from each other, I don't know if I, if I personally feel that they're so different in looking at our modeling assumptions that they're going to have that different of an impact on what our projections and what our needs are going to be. Yeah, if, if I might add, you know, the I think from the borough's perspective, or I can't speak for the borough, but you know, <laughs> slap me if I'm wrong. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, if we're high, that's not as bad as being low, because what that does is give us a little bit more time, maybe before the crisis point at the Palmer wants to highway parks highway intersection occurs. So, you know, we know what the big projects are. It is a funding issue. You know, the general fund program, the pull, you know, the rug got pulled out from underneath us just like everybody else. So it's <coughs> it's gonna be a, a an interesting process to get to the point as to what our project recommendations are and <coughs> how how we get those constructed and how we start filling in for example, the development community to help support the transportation system, which is a big, big, big issue out there. Yeah. They basically can build substandard roads and the borough fixes them. But we have been working on that a lot over, I mean, that's a whole other meeting, but I mean, we've spent all last winter really developing a much better relationship with our developers, and we've been working on having a lot better discussions with the cities on regional transportation discussions, because we in ourselves are our own region. I mean, just if you, from a planning perspective, trying to coordinate such a large area and trying to have a better understanding of like, you know, not to use the Z word, but perhaps like where we could entice <laughs> growth into certain areas so we could better prioritize, um, you know, our, our main road projects and, and talking about the advantages of having those places prioritized. Yeah. I love that zoning is becoming yeah, a bad word. If I, I could add that? this one last thing. <laughs> I was the only planning director in Massaburo to retire and not be forced to resign. It's the only claim to fame I have. Is that your website? You're also the physically largest planning director. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair, if I may, um, just to remind folks that Councilor Bowman is the only person who has ever been a planning director. 
the AMAS MPO is under a different set of federal mandates to use the latest planning assumptions and data available. So we're required by the feds and FHWA to do so. And I know maybe at some point um, the Matson Bureau may become an MPO. I don't know. That's yeah, let's not another go there. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> let's not go there. Yeah. Um, but just as a friendly reminder, in our RFP and scope of work, uh, we wrote in the regional collaboration as a piece to be in that in discussion of a regional travel demand model because we believe it is an important piece and to begin those discussions. And um, so I do appreciate everybody being here. We started those discussions with the Mats and Bureau in December of 2013 in Kruger. And then we've had quarterly meetings with our regional planning uh, committee and group uh, that Vivian Underwood had that up. So discussions on the model and model collaborations have been occurring since December of 2013. But I'm glad that everybody's here at the table today. I, I, I appreciate that. I, I did read through a synopsis that I was I was given this week, <clears throat> and I don't know if collaboration is a word that I would quite use. I think there's been a sharing of information. I know Emerson was part of this a little bit, but I, I was a bit kind of taken back this week as we were kind of pulled into this discussion that the word collaboration was necessarily being used for how these models were going. Collaboration means we, from the very beginning, kind of picked one model and we're working towards one end product. That's how I view collaboration. Sharing of information is going, you know, here's our model, here's where we're at in our process, here's your model, here's where you're at in the process. You know, keeping everybody on the same page as we're going kind of through these big endeavors that, in, that you know, could affect our, our regions. But I, I don't know if we're at a point where we've got a fully kind of collaborated model. And, and if that's the way we want to go, I think there's a lot of things that we could do to make that happen. And I know that we were part of, when the traffic demand uh, survey went out, you know, borough residents were put into that and that's one of the first times that's happened and I appreciate that. But as far as, you know, collaboration on a model, we still aren't quite there yet. And and like I said, I mean, we can use this as a jumping off point. And 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 to the to the most recent numbers kind of argument, um, I still can't quite figure out why when you go to do the model, we're telling you our most recent numbers for the borough are X. You know, whatever numbers are most recent for Anchorage, you can pick those. But for some reason, I keep getting kind of this idea that <coughs> that there needs to be a number picked by Anchorage for what Matsu Burrow's most recent numbers well, are. Madam Chairman. Yes. So. Madam Chairman. Well, basically, sorry, we appreciate yes, I'm, I'm you coming in um, today because this is a, a somewhat of an olive, olive branch to, to start that discussion because. We were concerned about the differences in the numbers and your numbers and what our consultant was uh, indicating your, your projections would be. There was a difference there, just as Mr. Flynn pointed out. And we need to do that reconciliation, but we wanted to be respectful to your numbers and your process, but at the same time, identify how the methodology and the time period that you developed those numbers so we can start some kind of reconciliation process. Well, I appreciate that. and. and we're happy to have that discussion. And, and just to look at the, this is Brad's record, just to look at the long-term process that Mr. Flynn mentioned we need to do, I think we need to develop some type of an MOA between the borough and the uni that describes how that regional model will come together so that we all agree on the same process. And I guess, correct me, oh, Mr. Steele. Yeah, um, excuse me if my naivete shows <laughs> through, but we're doing a, um, a plan that we have to submit to the feds in terms of um, the region, um, looking out to 2040. And it, it, the, the problem I had was um, there's a slight difference in timing in that the Matsu's numbers are going to 35 or going to 40 and they can be adjusted. But, uh, but in submitting that, that plan, what I didn't want to do is I didn't want to raise a huge red flag for those folks reviewing the federal plan to say, what's this? Uh, because of the differences. So we've got to use something, it seems to me, uh, such that we can put forward that the joint planning area uh, numbers to the feds that won't uh, won't drive them nuts and will be reasonable in terms of uh, out to 2040. And it uh, so so that's my concern is that you know do we pick one do we pick another I don't think that's the appropriate thing it's to agree upon something to submit. So. Yeah, 
Chair? Mr. Steele, I, I completely agree with you. I guess what I don't understand is the feds are concerned about your MPO boundaries. We are not within your MPO boundaries. So our numbers, if you'd like them to be part of the model because you're trying to see how our influence is going to influence the area, the numbers you're using is most current for your region, whatever those are or whatever those are, but that doesn't mean that our numbers have to necessarily come into that. I agree. I mean, we're not in your entire <laughs> So, so just explain that and then no, I'll be frank over it, Well, if I may, uh, I, I just want to say I, something I was going to bring up, and I know that this has brought up before. I know that it has not been, I don't want to say it hasn't been federally mandated, but I know that there has been a discussion of a, a regional transportation yes. authority, I mean, in having a joint, but AMATS is not it. <laughs> we are worried about our boundaries, I mean, and uh, sure. yeah, I mean, really that they're, there isn't that that regional yet and yes central region DOT encompasses what would be considered that regional area because both the Matsu borough and AMATS fall within their within the, those boundaries but we don't have I mean I don't know if that's what we want to propose I mean is that AMATS becomes that regional I mean I don't yeah, that's not what we're trying yeah. to do yeah <laughs> right I just now. didn't want to <laughs> submit a plan that, that just has a huge red flag on it so just that question yeah. What are you doing? And if I may to and to address Mr. Flynn, I I um, the and I will speak for the TAC members that, that took action. It was not viewed as an ideal situation um, to to have the I termed it splice, with the understanding that I I know what we went through before with the MTP having three different models, three different sets of assumptions, three different what ifs, and I it made me realize come to the conclusion that you know. Ever since AMATS accepted a joint regional model, it has been a real headache. It has put us into, into the, the middle of conversations that, you know, is this the right tool to give us the toll, no toll, the bridge numbers, no bridge, you know, all of those things when really what, what um, uh, we need to know is what is the impact on Anchorage from the development of the valley, and that's soon to be from two points. And so it was not, a, it was not ideal. We recognize that they were different we wanted to know what the differences were uh, because, it, you know, when we, uh, Lance had sent out to the technical committee a table that shows based on, you know, recognizing different um, base years, but the differences in the projections between DOL and ICER and even the base year is quite a bit different in some areas and I, I don't understand that. How is it that um, the, the aggregate numbers are so different for DOL and um, the, as reflected in RSG's numbers, then what ICER or, or what the METSU has or what the Connecticut Crossing used, and so I, or what AMETS had before. So there's a lot, lot of questions, but the reluctance I, I sense from the T, and, and I actually said that I can um, explain a splice recognizing that the numbers from the borough may be high on that, that, that uh, connection to, into Anchorage better than I can say that Anchorage is going to assume for its planning purposes and that there is 20% or that I think it's 20,000 people fewer in 2040 than what Matt was assuming in 2035 without that collaboration occurring. And, and that's where, I, again, it's I um, had thought that there, it, it, I had realized then that it was my fault for not pushing this a little bit more because of my familiarity with what's been going on in the Matsu borough. Um, and so I didn't mean, no, I, I mean, I, I didn't mean to di dis, um, to dish you at all on, on the question that you're asking is it, but I think it's important to understand you know the the differences and I think it was Mr. Spring who mentioned before that um, all of us I, I think statewide have relied um, very heavily on ICER's data that was regularly updated every two years everybody could tap into it that hasn't happened and so I think that is something I think uh, Mr. Spring and the consultant team had and Teresa had recommended that we start looking the municipality, you know, looking at using, and then AMATS in, in turn, perhaps the DOL numbers, but I think understanding the differences is important. That's all I wanted to, to get to. I could live with this place as a DOT person because that it is DOT's facilities that are most greatly affected. Um, and that's all I, I meant by that. Um, well, here, here's why this is important. Um, and this is something I think Mr. Steele would appreciate probably more than most of the um, if we make assumptions of excess assumptions of growth in a massive world, it's fine 
for the LRTP up there because obviously the projects don't change that much. Within Anchorage, we have a more dynamic transportation network and the focus tends to be a little more internal. And you know, I think specifically for a little road in, not too far from where Mr. Steele lives, which is in desperate need of funding. And if we are diverting funding to uh, manage growth that isn't gonna occur to the detriment of Spinard Road, then we're perhaps negatively impacting a portion of our citizenry up here. And, and so, um, Absolutely, <coughs> going forward, we need to be more collaborative. It can't just be sharing of information. Um, absolutely, we need to be working from the same data set. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that ICER decided not to update their numbers. I, I wish that hadn't been the case. From everything I know at this date, it's not going to happen again anytime soon, if ever. So <coughs> we better come up with a better data set that we can all rely on. In terms of the decision the policy committee needs to make in the next month, next meeting, <laughs> next meeting, which we're not having tomorrow because we don't have any business items figured out yet. <laughs> so January, we got to have a good data set that makes sense for the AMAX service area. And um, I don't reject the MAPS numbers, but I think we. I mean, I, I understand, Jennifer, you spend more time interacting with FHWA bureaucrats than I do. I apologize for that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I cannot, in, this place does not pass the red place test with me. I'm sorry. Um, we have to use good data. And I think we have the right data set. And I think we need to start helping bring us all together to use the same data set. I'll get off my soapbox now. Yeah. Uh, it seems like we've reached the last agenda item, which is the discussion of the uh, questions and topics. So I just wanted to reiterate an option for your consideration that has come up before at the previous policy committee meeting. Uh, one of the stakeholders raised it, and we had independently raised it with the AMAT staff, which is that uh, there is an option that doesn't require you to pick one set of numbers. We can actually analyze two potential future socioeconomic scenarios which in my professional opinion actually provides you decision makers more information. The observation it has been observed or questioned whether the different numbers would make a difference several times during this discussion. Well, as a model or analyst, my answer is let's run both. And then you folks will have the information to see if it makes a difference. So we can, we can, you know, we can have the DOL numbers and we can run those and we can have the splice numbers and we can run those through the same model in the future, and then you'll does that and we can show you the performance metrics and say, okay, that you know this this is this is this is actually using the tool, the data and the modeling tool as a de decision support mechanism, which is what they're really intended for, from my viewpoint as a model developer and forecaster. So I just wanted to place that option on the table since I perceive that people are now talking about, you know, should we pick this or should we pick it's a timing. It's a timing issue from my point of view. And, you know, the projects, as you said, are not going to change that much. Um, it's it's when is it going to happen, and uh, and so that's you know that's a problem that we're fighting with in terms of trying to make the appropriate decisions on, on projects. There's also the conversation of. I, that's not a double <coughs> modeling effort, but that does have an increase in the modeling effort in the sense that, you know, there's still have to be the discussion of can we afford to have those two different analyses and how is that going to be addressed in the plan? I mean, really, of having those two different alternatives to look at. So that's a, a this. I like the idea of looking at both, but it also complicates things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, just a couple of thoughts. Uh, the issue, on the issue of what does it take to comply with the federal regulations? That is entirely an AMATS issue, obviously. Mm -hmm. And we will leave that to the AMATS staff and their consultants to, to determine that. Um, speaking to Mr. Flynn's issue, kind of the what difference does it make issue, um, I'd suggest uh, the answer there really is very little. You know, the Glen Highway will, be, will have a little bit more traffic if you use uh, MATSU's population and employment numbers not that much. 
and as you get further away from where the Glen Highway comes in at Anchorage, the effect will be even more diminished. Um, you know, the, in terms of population, employment, and traffic, Anchorage really, you know, this this is its own world, and AMATS doesn't. I mean, but not the, AMATS. The, that's who doesn't really affect it that much. The, pro the, the problem with that, I mean, the problem with that is it, it does put an impact on our system, whether it's expending money for an additional lane on the Glen, or if those numbers were truly real, of ex expediting the need for improvements of intersections in the municipality. We really need to have um, a real good understanding uh, of, of those numbers. And again, like I said, we wanted to be respectful of your numbers and just didn't arbitrarily dismiss them from our uh, modeling. So we have a full understanding now from you being here today as your methodology, the resources that you used, and the age of those uh, data. So there's a difference and we have to somehow reconcile it. Oh, but I, my point was that if you examined, if you ran the model with both sets of, you know, a lower Matsu number and a higher Matsu number, the net effect on the street network in Anchorage would not be very great. That's my professional off the cuff. Uh, What's our budget so this year? Thirty million bucks. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, actually, I have to say our, our CIP and SIP and everything else are already <laughs> projected for the next several years. So this is more looking even. <laughs> if I may also yeah. make a suggestion to go back, it was something that uh, the technical committee had talked about but did not act on, and that was the possibility of of uh, coming into an agreement on the externals, the numbers that are coming into Anchorage and impacting Anchorage's numbers. And those are right now we have very very good historical data on the growth on the Glen Highway, and then we have very recently presented information about. Uh, the updated um, assumptions for the Kinnickerum Crossing and what those impacts may be. I mean, that could be another alternative because you're right, we do need to know those. If we're overestimating those those impacts, um, then it could, as Ms. Weaver mentioned, it, it, it could mean something different. And yet it's really the, the numbers that are coming into Anchorage and if, if we have very good data on that, because we have very good directional data, um, that that could be another way to allow Anchorage and AMATS to focus its model update really on understanding, you know, once they cross that boundary, where are they traveling to? And I think that's going to be well informed by the, the household travel survey mm -hmm. uh, by including the Matsu. I mean, that's another possibility that could be explored. But, but the, um, I'm not, as an AMATS member, I'm not really sure of the benefit of having the Anchorage model um, um, overlay any of the planning assumptions in the Matsu Borough. I can I can see taking that number on the Glen Highway that's projected right now, and and looking at a, at a way of possibly reducing that forecasted number based on a lower, uh, and and using that number as a as a control total perhaps for our scenarios. Um, and yet I I um, I kind of put that out there. Uh, since it's really, you know, model the, the impacts of, of the bridge are going to be both Anchorage and Matsu. It's just it's going to be different, directionally different. And um, but I throw that out there as consideration for the technical committee and and for the policy members to think about as well. I mean, it just seems like uh, to me that, that we wouldn't want to go that direction. I mean, how do you analyze the Kinnikarm crossing because we don't have any externals there now? How do you project that? I mean, I think that that is the tool that we need, and we've got it. I mean, it makes sense. We need. It's nice to know where the people in Matsu are going, you know, in, in Anchorage and, and vice versa. And I, I just think at, the, at, at this point, I think it's, I think we need to reconcile the uh, socioeconomic data and have a model that would that at least, and I don't think if we if we use different assumptions in the Matsu that we're necessarily begrudging any of the work that was done in the Matsu Valley. And I just think that it's, it's six months later, things have changed and, and what, what seems most reasonable to us. And I, that, and I think that's the way we should go. I mean, if. Obviously, if the um, fiscal climate is different, it's, it, and it was different a year ago, and and and, and two years before, and I just think we were supposed to use the latest planning assumptions, and I think that we need to take a hard look at, at just the fact that that Matsu data is maybe a year old, and it's quite stale if it's a, if, it, if it's a year old. That's that's my my sense. And one of the things that we do when we write these reports, I mean that we're doing this, and it's something. 
you have to do, I mean, is, is clearly document what your assumptions are because we're going to be revisiting this in a couple of years. <laughs> this is a conversation I see myself having in just a short time as we, as we go through this update again. And one of the things you have to do, I mean, is, is take a look, okay, this is the assumption that we made. Was that assumption correct? Was it reasonable? Does it need to be modified or changed in any way as we go through this planning cycle year after year? And I think that, like you said, this is a good place for us to start up until this point has been discussions and sharing, but from this point onwards needs to be collaboration to move towards regional. Um, but I don't think we're quite there yet, and we need to move forward in our planning process, or else we're going to start, so. we're going to be delaying our own MTP process, and we have to go through the federal process to, I mean, to continue doing what we need to do. So yeah, we're, uh, I think we are at that point where we need to make a decision. It's not today, I mean, but from, from this discussion, that's what we're trying to, you know, how should we reach closure is the final <laughs> kind of point of discussion. So, I guess that question there, uh, what, what does closure look like and what are our options? Those are, those are some of the things we've been discussing here. It looks like the options are either taking the Matt Superhero's projections and kind of splicing, which was kind of a previous recommendation, using the, the RSG numbers, which are based on the Department of Labor and Workforce numbers, using externals, externals. And, or even using the Matsu Burrows and looking at the percentage decrease as the externals. So we have a number of options that we can consider, and we just clearly need to document those assumptions and have a, I mean, and really have a, have a justified reason that we can straight face tell FHWA why we made that why we made that assumption and what what we're moving forward with so are there any other I guess points that anybody else wants to share to the discussion ask any questions or give me anything else to mull over while I work out tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> but I just wanted to respond to your question I asked my team about uh, the growth rates since the DOL numbers on which our future projections are based were actually you know actual absolute numbers in the future we didn't use the growth rate method it, we have to actually back that out from our calculations because we had to factor in self-employment data and other things that aren't sort of tightly accounted for in the numbers, but we can come back with the actual growth rate, that the effective growth rates from the DOL, that that would be useful information. As compared to ISER? Right. Okay. <coughs> Mr. I have a question of RSG. Um, I was looking at comparing the numbers uh, at a glance set of spreadsheet and looking at the employment numbers and that. And one thing that struck me was that, I mean, uh, the RSG uh, household and population numbers are lower than and that you can have arm processing and, the pre that it, and, and I understand that. But one thing that struck me was that employment numbers seem to be higher. Yes. And, and I wonder why, and maybe you can cover that in your, in your presentation, I, I forgot, but I just wonder, I'm curious why that is. Well, I'm going to ask the Miguel uh, expert here about that. We had some discussion, but I think he can, he can answer that sort of more succinctly. So the way we came up with our employment numbers was we actually modeled it as a function of the labor force. And so mostly labor force participation rates and historically those have been declining, which I think would lead to, if we continue those trends, it would lead to lower employment numbers. But um, we, we made the assumption that they're gonna have to hit a floor at some point. They can't keep declining indefinitely. And so we brought them down to a floor, carried that forward, and then calculated employment based on those. So really our employment is a, um, it's a function of population, as opposed to looking at traditional growth rates in play. Saying this is where what we think growth rate will be. It's more of a function of what's the population between over age 16. And it, what struck me about it was that um, the population numbers that, that, that you're forecasting may be lower, but the employment numbers are higher, and then they offset each other in terms of the net effect in the, on the modeling process. I mean, it may be very small, like Tom was saying. You know, if you have more. I mean, it's considerably higher employment, I think, than the other forecasts, and 10% higher. 20% higher than the kind of arm crossing estimate for employment in 2035. Yeah. Any other questions or comments for the 
Go to the order. Would, just one little comment or a question, I suppose. Is the bypass road uh, um, also going to have the right of way for the power lines uh, rather than going <laughs> to the city of Wasso? <laughs> Is that the theory? Is that really for the good of the order? That's really good. <laughs> I can tell you that the power lines are uh, within. 300 feet of my house, and I think that the die has been cast on where the, the power lines will be good. Electrifying question. <laughs> <laughs> Craig, did you have something? Well, I was just going to suggest that uh, it would probably be a good idea for us to schedule a work session after the first year for the TAC to finalize so that when the TAC meets, we can have a recommendation. Yeah, because when we can our bring 10 ounce gloves. Well, our first, our TAC meeting is the 8th because the first falls on a Thursday, so the second Thursday is the 8th, so it would have to be very early. The 4th, well, 5th, the 6th, or the 7th. <laughs> That's pretty early. Yeah. But that was, I mean, I, either that or we're going to have to delay it another month. Yeah. And I, I don't, I, it seems like we need a work session on this that we talk it out. Well, Madam Chairman, at, you know, be, in, in advance of that, how much effort would it take to model the additional twenty thousand? I'm sorry. How much additional effort would it take to model the twenty thousand trips? We're talking twenty thirty-five. The difference between to do the sensitivity analysis idea. Well, we have to complete up to. I mean, my proposal was predicated on updating the entire model first. Mm -hmm. So we would be ready to do that until fairly late in the schedule. Mm -hmm. So in other words, I, I'm sorry, I, I can't, you know, we don't have a model that's been updated. Uh, so I can't do that until I have an updated, I would prefer not to do that until I have an updated model. Well, I guess the question, I, I don't mean to speak for you, Jerry, but it's a question of what will I, what level of effort would it be to do that sensitivity analysis? Yeah. I mean, how much Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you meant you were had, hoping to have an answer both, for Jerry. Both, but both, but <laughs> both. Okay. I should have been more clear. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that the um, the main workload would be to make sure that we have the, all the tests, all the distributions. So, right for me to do that. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, somehow we're going to have to reconcile, as I said earlier. We're just going to have to reconcile it somehow. I know, but with an asterisk. If, if I, may too, I guess the question I have for the proposal as it's been um, uh, laid out before, now that it, with more information about the, how the maps and borough developed their assumptions for growth and development, how would you apply a, a lower growth rate or growth assumptions over there knowing now that they were pretty robust in how they, you know, it, it's not taking a 20% across the board reduction may not be appropriate, it may not give you an accurate idea of, of how the borough would actually grow. Um, I, so what is that, that methodology, I guess, and, and has it um, been uh, proposed, look, n understanding now how the Matsum borough model was developed? Well, I think it's an excellent question, but the answer is, is in our minds so far, pretty much the answer of applying the distribution that we would apply anyway, and just to repeat this, we had always proposed to use the actual spatial distribution of employment and jobs at the TAC level that MSB has developed because, as you saw, a lot of homework went into thinking about where things would go. You also heard, just to verify what, what Tom said, that the ICER growth rates were applied across the board and then the distribution was made. And so I think it's the, uh, what we would propose to do would be to essentially use the DOL-based total Matsu Valley estimate and distribute it using exactly the same distribution process that you folks used, which is where a lot of the homework went as, as far as I understand what you folks have said today. So essentially what you're saying is we're swapping out growth rates? Yeah. And, and then to answer your question, I, uh, I've been doing some mental math while uh, we've been talking, and so I'm going to... I think that we could probably, you know, come up with the second future scenario, sort of by swapping out the, uh, the fiscal analysis task in the, in the current scope, roughly. 
we need to tweak something else, but it, it might, we might be able to, I think we can probably scale it into that price range, which you well, I think recall was uh, I appreciate that. And I think we are going to be looking for your professional opinion with respect to the growth rates and the ICER assumptions versus the Department of Labor assumptions. Just one little other point, too. It's in our work plan always, I think, to, um, to consult or collaborate with the borough when we come up with the revisions to the TAC allocation. Uh, given that if, we, if TAC and <coughs> policy committee decides to go with different uh, forecast numbers, control totals, we need to reduce the TAC allocations. Like Jeff said, we're going to, we were planning to do this linear reduction, but we wanted to go back and meet with uh, MSB staff, look at the maps, make sure we didn't make any you know, fatal flaws in our assumptions. From what I know about modeling and the involvement that I've had with it before, those TAZs have a greater impact on where, I mean, where the distributions are, what's actually on those roads, and so what the forecasted needs are going to be even more so than some changes, minor changes in volumes. If you don't have those TAZs and the origin destinations actually properly programmed, that's going to have the greater impact on your overall model. So that's where I would want to make sure that whatever we're using, we're definitely using the Matsu Borough because you do know your, I mean, just like we know where people are coming from and going to an Anchorage a lot better. I mean, <laughs> it's our city. We, we know, we've studied it, we've looked at it so many times. I mean, and you guys are doing the same for your area. I only have a general knowledge of it. I am not intimate with it at all, so. Just if I may, on one observation, on the slide that Tom showed, uh, which was quite informative about the results of your charrettes, a lot of the markings on that map, to my mind, are things that you're not going to be able to change. If there's no water there, if there's a wetland there, so it seems to me that, I mean, this would really be a question to you, it seems to me that some of the distributional conclusions you reached are sort of in operation no matter how much total growth you have. You know, there are agglomerations, we know that there are agglomeration effects, so jobs often locate where there are other jobs already, and so there is some subtleties there, but this, as John mentioned, you know, we could have a consultation with folks and say, okay, is this, is this given the different growth rate, is this distribution still accounting appropriately for agglomeration effects or other clustering types of activity. <clears throat> that honestly seems probably the most reasonable kind of collaboration you're going to get at these points in this project because we all have timelines we're trying to meet and I think probably the better goal is when we come around to our next four or five years that we really, <clears throat> it, takes, it takes a grouping of staff between the two entities to really sit down with meetings agendas, notes, and some formal agreements to actually bring back to these bodies, both your bodies, because I can say the other reason I'm, I wasn't quite down with the word collaboration yet is our body knows nothing about this. You know, and they haven't been brought into this. So I think for collaboration, it needs to be, we have some, some decision-making bodies that need to be on board with the regional component and joint planning. And so <laughs> in four to five years, we have time to kind of develop that and to make sure we're on the bandwagon so we can meet timelines for our next set of, of requirements. that I think what's being proposed is very reasonable and very doable right now. Okay. Any other questions or comments before we go to the order? I appreciate everybody being here and sharing the information. I feel like I've learned a lot and it gives me a lot to think about before we get together to make this decision and move forward. I definitely feel more informed, so <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, it is 2.42 p.m. So, Thank you.